Thank you for joining us for another installment of Uniquely Union. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing my boss, Dr. Jimmy <laughs> Carter, the director of the Union County Public Schools. And it is my pleasure to be here. And let's trace my history with you. Okay. My history with you didn't start with you. No. It started with your grandmother, Myrtle Carter. Yes. Who lived across the fence from me when I was growing up for a year or two. Yeah. But I went to church with her. For several years. She was a wonderful lady. She was. She's a real <laughs> sweetheart. And uh, then my next contact with you, or actually my first contact with you, was when you were in high school, mm -hmm. lunch, and you were a senior. Yes. I was a freshman. You sure was. We did not associate with each other, therefore. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. You were on your table, I was on mine. And another interesting note is that your grandfather, Frank Carter, who was Myrtle's husband, and I never knew him because he died several years ago, yeah. but he was an educator. He was. He taught in the one-room schoolhouses through, throughout Union County. Oddly, oddly enough, when we were doing some of our clean-out of central office, we had to go through filing cabinets to see what we could get rid of and what we couldn't. And I would just open a drawer and just flip it back to see what it was. And it was uh, my Papa Carter's payroll. Mm. That's what I landed on. I thought, well, we'll leave that there. <laughs> As a hidden treasure. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> but you started out to be an accountant. Yes. And wound up where you are. Yes. So how did you get from being an accountant almost to becoming the director of Union County Schools? Well... Uh, I originally began my college career as an accounting major, and that's what my dad wanted me to be, and uh, that was a career path that he had chosen, and he thought that would be a good path for me as well, and so that's what I started, and as I entered my sophomore year in college and I started getting more accounting classes, I realized sitting in my dorm room, I did not enjoy that at all, and I just pictured my life uh, sitting at a desk with a calculator and I didn't think that would be something I would enjoy. So I changed majors. I did not tell my dad. Uh, up until I was doing my student teaching, and I reflected, and I thought, my dad is going to be at my graduation, and he's going to find <laughs> this out, so I best, I best come clean. So I told him uh, halfway through my last semester, well, quarter at that time, uh, at Tennessee Tech, and uh, he was fine with that. He was okay with that, and I was really surprised. And so I graduated in December. My first job was substitute teaching in Nashville. And that was an experience. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after that, I was at Lectoral Elementary. And you told me that Lectoral was your favorite of all of the positions you've held. If why, I, why was that? If I reflect back, Lectoral was the most pleasant experience. And I don't know if that's just where you start, uh, but... When I was a teacher at Lectoral, I felt like that we were a family. I felt like everyone cared about the students. I know I did, and uh, you could see through the deeds of the teachers at Lectoral. If there was a need for any student in our school, everybody banded together to help that student. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe that that was the most unique experience that I had, and I loved. I loved my experience at Lectoral. And you were the 8th grade teacher. I was the 8th grade teacher. And how long were you at Lectoral? About three uh, years? Well, because I started in January, it would be three and a half years. Mm -hmm. and then you transferred to the old Horace Maynard High School. I did. Uh, there was an opportunity, and as much as I love Lectoral, and I think when you're at that age, there's always greener pastures out there. Uh, I was very happy at Lectoral. But there was an opportunity, and I thought, well, I'll take that opportunity and see. And I taught at I taught eighth grade at uh, Horace Maynard High School for four years. And then you went to Sharps Chapel as principal. Well, that too is a story because <laughs> um, I did not I enjoyed my time at the high school, but philosophically, I did not believe that eighth graders need to be in that high school. And it was hard for me to teach in a place where I just philosophically didn't feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And so uh, 
obviously I'm not going to change that situation, so I'd actually requested to go back to Luxville. And Mr. Kopic, uh, as good as he was about trying to help and do for anyone, he, uh, he told me if there was a position open, he'd be happy to transfer me. Um, but that uh, Mr. West had, uh, was looking at the adult ed position and the principal at Sharps Chapel, that position might be open. So I thought, well, this is a unique opportunity and a challenge. And although I had my master's, I was like one of many. I did that for a pay raise. I did not have that much of an interest in going to administration. But I, th I thought that would be a, a challenge. So uh, I accepted the position at Sharps Chapel Elementary. And that was a difficult year for you because your father was ill that year. It was, and uh, one thing I can say without a doubt, the people, uh, the teachers, the community at Sharps Chapel were wonderful. Uh, I coached basketball, and uh, actually I was having basketball practice when I found out my dad had had a heart attack, and uh, that landed us at St. Mary's and then at Vanderbilt, and I remember many games coming, coming to the school to coach a ball game, and the entire Thing was set up and ready and I walked out on co the court and started coaching. Uh, the entire school rallied around me and uh, made sure that everything was set up, everything was in line. They knew how to do everything and that uh, all the way down to the deposits, the bank deposits, they were brought to me and I took them to the bank. I had to sign the deposit slips. They would meet me wherever and whenever I needed and uh, very grateful to to that experience because uh, that would have been really tough if I had not had people mm -hmm. like that at Sharps Chapel. And then you were only there that one year. I was there one year and uh, the position, the principal's position at Big Ridge opened up and that time Trevor Work was the school board member in Big Ridge and he called and asked if I'd be interested in that position and obviously that's the community I currently lived in, mm -hmm. and it's the school that I uh, attended when I was in elementary school. And I weighed that very, very strongly. I didn't automatically take that position because I did enjoy my time at Sharps Chapel. I liked the people. They made me feel at home. Um, but I thought, well, that is where I live. That would be a lot closer of a drive so I accepted the job at Big Ridge. And you were there quite a while. Well, it would have seemed like quite a while, but two years. Really? So yeah. It seemed like longer for the rest of us that weren't <laughs> there with you. <laughs> no, I was only there for two years. And then what happened to you? Uh, we built a high school. Yes. And I'll be honest with you, I was content at Big Ridge. And when... When we look at applications to hire somebody now, one of the first things we look at is where all they have been. And to make a determination if, if they had some stability. If you looked at my resume at that time and I was applying and you didn't know me, it looked like nobody really wanted me because I never <laughs> stayed anywhere longer than four years. But uh, I requested to, to open up the middle school because I wanted that challenge. I just... Uh, I just wanted that challenge. And it was a challenge, was it? It was a challenge you indeed. you didn't even have furniture in a lot of cases. We didn't have furniture. The school, uh, well, there was a reason they built a high school, that uh, the old high school was overcrowded, and it, there was a lot of areas that were ran down. The painting wasn't great. There was a lot of areas mm -hmm. that needed to be have attention to. So I spent the better part of my last year at Big Ridge, uh, both running Big Ridge Elementary and planning the middle school. And then that summer, uh, finishing up schedules and that type of thing, and really researching what a middle school was because I didn't have a background with middle schools. Uh, no one in the school system really had that background. So I had to do a lot of research in opening up the middle school. Uh, the summer before, I was determined that that entire school was gonna be painted. I just didn't realize it was going to be painted by me and whatever volunteers I could grab. <laughs> but uh, I started down at the cafeteria in that bathroom. I remember Mary Effler was going to be one of our teachers, and, and 
she volunteered this one particular day and she's like, those bathrooms are disgusting and people on their hands and knees trying to scrub and clean and paint. But we had a lot of people that volunteered to help uh, throughout the summer. So someone may come and say, I'm going to work this week. But the week we opened up, that's when we finished. Mm -hmm. That's when we were completely finished. So I did the scheduling at night and painting and cleaning during the day. Not a lot of sleep. <laughs> no, because scheduling in middle school when you don't know that concept is, is really tough. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't realize what special areas were and how the rotation of that. and But I learned. Now, where in the middle of all of this did you get married? I've kind of forgotten that part. I was at Big Ridge. Okay. When Melissa and I were married. Well, and then you were at the high or the middle school. I want to say six years. <laughs> okay. And then you went to. I went to central office. And how'd that happen? Well, Mr. Thomas uh, was our newly appointed director of schools, and he had everybody to reapply for their position. I remember that. And I applied for my middle school position, <laughs> knowing in my heart of hearts nobody really wanted it. I couldn't have named one single person that was really vying for my job, and I felt like I had job security, and I'd probably be there as long as I wanted to be there because I don't. I think everybody either knew what a challenge that school could be mm -hmm. or didn't know enough and didn't want to find out what it really was. But the middle school, to me, and I believe it's probably the staff, the middle school to me was as finally ran a school that I was at. I, we had, we enjoyed it. You had to mm -hmm. like that age group. If you did not like that age group, then you were going to hate your job. Well, eighth grade was all I'd ever been around. And so I loved that age group. That was the group of kids that I felt like I could help and I could relate to. So I felt like I had job security. I applied for the middle school. Mr. Thomas called me up and um, handed me a letter, which I started opening. And he said, you don't have to open it. I will tell you, you've been transferred. And I felt the blood leave my <laughs> face because I did not have any idea where he might have transferred me to. And when he said central office, I said, doing what? And he said, well, we don't have anybody doing personnel, and I'd like for you to do personnel and, uh, and in a supervisory role. And in that instant, I realized that he was not going to leave me and my wife in central office together. Mm -hmm. I said, where are you going to put Melissa? And he said, well, I would rather tell her myself. I said, well, she's downstairs, and she's the next person coming up. And she's going to tell me, <laughs> so why don't you just tell me? <laughs> and he said, well, I'm going to make her the principal of the middle school. Uh, I just, I was just floored. And prior to that move for her, she was at the central office doing attendance. I she think, did attendance she? and transportation. Mm -hmm. She was actually my supervisor. Fascinating. <laughs> because I became her supervisor. She, in essence, in that day, took over all of my responsibilities and I assumed all of hers. And the middle school is a great success story because Union County had never had one. Mm -hmm. Practically everybody on the Union County's teaching staff, probably a lot of us went to Union County. We'd never attended a middle school. No. And in six years, you had a pretty smooth operation going. In that six years, yes, we did. Uh, we saw our scores rise. We were doing well academically. You were SACS accredited. I we remember were the first that. accredited school in the county. Yes. So there were a lot of really good things. And uh, I feel like that that group of people was the group of people that would go to battle for me, and I would go to battle for them. Uh, an interesting story, I did not get to name my assistant principal. I was told who my assistant principal was going to be, which I was fine with that, but, you know, in any of those positions, you'd like to have some input as to who your assistant mm -hmm. principal is going to be, but it was uh, Miss Janet Mobley was my assistant. 
and she was either a first or second grade teacher at Maine Elementary. And had been for several years. And I remember thinking, how is a second grade teacher going to adjust to middle school age kids? So uh, I traveled over to Maine Elementary from Big Ridge to introduce myself because we had never met. And um, once we met and got to know each other, I would not have asked for anybody else. She was perfect for that job. Uh, we uh, were a good combination in the fact that I did not enjoy teacher evaluations. I don't feel like I was very good with teacher, but she was a state evaluator. Mm -hmm. So she had a background in teacher evaluations. Uh, she was a very calming force at the middle school. I'll never forget when we had teacher uh, faculty meetings I'm really cut and dry. When you have a fac faculty meeting, you go in, you tell or discuss and have a conversation about what you wanted to meet about, and then you leave. Mm -hmm. Janet, will, every time we had one, she goes, wait, I've got to have a door prize. I want these teachers to know how important they are to us. We're having a door prize. And she would go out and beat the bushes, go to local businesses, and she would have a door prize at every faculty meeting we had. That's why we complemented each other very well. Now, was she your assistant principal the entire time you yes. were principal? Yes. I thought she was. Yeah, and she's wonderful. She was just absolutely wonderful. So you wound up at the central office. Mm -hmm. Surprised to wind up at the central yes. office, actually. And did you enjoy the experience initially, or did you grow into it? That's something I had to grow into. Um, to begin with, when you move into central office, and everybody that's came, that has come over there understands this now, there's no guidance. No one tells you this is what you need to be doing, this is how you do it, this is the contacts to the state, all this stuff. You pretty much figure that out yourself. And I'm sure when you came to central office, it's the same way. You didn't get a lot of guidance as to what your job, what responsibility was. I made good were. friends with my state consultant quickly. <laughs> and that was a learning curve for me because, so the first week or two, I, I, I felt like I did, I'm did. i sitting at a desk and having no idea what to do. And uh, so I did make contacts. Uh, I was over personnel, and there weren't any personnel files in that office. And so I had to gather up what I could, and, and I looked through to find out exactly what a personnel file should contain and started personnel files. And then uh, insurance was right around the corner because we had open enrollment, and that was one of my responsibilities. And I learned that, and it's just like you did. You came into that job, you made contacts, and, you, and they were most helpful at the state level. Mm -hmm. uh, but you just figured out yourself. If you didn't have... Uh, initiative to do the job, then you weren't probably going to last very long. And insurance is a scary thing because you're dealing with people's very survival in some cases. And you would have teachers call and ask insurance type questions assuming that I would know the answer. Mm -hmm. So I had to do a lot of on-the-job self-training during that time. Transportation, I was over transportation. And although I grew up here, I probably know how to get to all the schools, but outside that, I, I, I don't know. We have a, a lot, lot of back roads, don't we? <laughs> yes, we do. Some that I were, was totally unaware of. But you learn. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I spent that first year learning that job and creating it the way that I, if I was director, I would want it to be created. I would want uh, systems and files in place so that in the event that they were needed for one reason or another, they would be there. And coming into director, now while you were at the central office before you ever were interim director, is that what you did the whole time, transportation, insurance? and? Well, I went in and out of personnel. Yes. Uh, went in and out of insurance. Uh, I was supervisor over the middle school and then became supervisor of the elementaries. And so that in itself was a learning lesson, although I'd been uh, the... Uh, a principal in an elementary, being a supervisor is a total different scenario. So uh, that too was a learning thing for me because you have to remember I was originally secondary and so elementary did not come naturally to me. And that not being my background, I had to, I had to read up on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. 
but I enjoyed that and it opened my eyes to a lot of things in elementary. Um, I do remember when the grandkids started going through school and they had a calculator in the early grades. I was just appalled by that. <laughs> we never had one, did we? When no, we were in and really that was considered cheating in some classes if you had one. <laughs> so um, that was one of the first things I did is said we are not going to have elementary students using calculators. I, you don't use a calculator until you understand how you to actually solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And the calculator is just there to do some of the heavier math so you're not doing long division while you're trying to solve a different problem. So that was one of the first things. And, and I tell you, that was like prying something from a cold dead hand. <laughs> <laughs> they did not want to give up those calculators. But I just didn't feel like that, that served our students well. And then, of course, that's a prime example where there's division among the more seasoned teachers. They were all in favor of that. Well, what happened is once the state allowed you to use a calculator on the test, mm -hmm. then that was just open season for using calculators throughout the year. And the difference is you could use a calculator on the test on problems that were not computation. So you still had to know how to work, work the problem. Mm -hmm. It was just, it sped up the process to be able to use a calculator on different problems. Um, I felt like that maybe one of the things that we were doing was skipping the process of understanding the math before we started introducing calculators. And then, of course, in every job there must be a little turmoil. There's always turmoil. And the school system <laughs> has never been exempt from that. No. So you, at some point, found yourself interim director of schools. I did. And um, that was as about as much a surprise as getting sent to central office. Um, that year, Mr. Goforth was, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say put out, but he was uh, asked to step aside, and the, the school board was determined whether they were going to oust him in that position. So in the meantime, we had to have an interim a director, and uh, Marilyn Toppin started out. Mm -hmm. Marilyn and I worked together at Electoral, and I always consider Marilyn a friend of mine. Uh, when she came into central office, I think she was a little bit taken aback about how that office actually operated, pleasantly so. Uh, and I know the, the, first, the first week she was there, we had an issue that came up, and I really don't remember the issue, but we put it into it very quickly, and she was like, I did not know that that's how that worked, and that's how we always do this. So I think she was very pleasantly surprised. I think that was good insight for Ms. Toppins. Uh, she was there until March, and there was a school board meeting, and they, de they determined that they wanted a change in that position, and... Um, they nominated me to be in that position. I wasn't prepared to go into that position. And um, I, I tell you, that's a really a double-edged sword because Marilyn was my friend, had always been my friend, and accepting that position puts you in an awkward position. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I never sought that position. I sought that position when I applied for that position. Uh, I wasn't out to take Marilyn's, take her out of that position because I realized, just like you do, you have a director there in place. Everybody's doing their job. The director gives you guidance and a vision and that type of thing, uh, but everybody in our office was doing their job and the school system was functioning. So there wasn't any reason for me to try to take Ms. Hoppins out if I felt like that, that she wasn't doing something that should have been done, I would have gone to her. Mm -hmm. So, yep, at that school board meeting on March 15th, I'll never forget the date, I became the interim director. So at that point, uh, we did not have a bookkeeper. And that was very difficult because we did one of the things that you're never supposed to do. Glenn Coppock, who was the bookkeeper, and he took a medical leave, mm -hmm. and he's the only one that knew a lot about the financial management of the central office, and when he just left one day, we're kind of sitting there, 
panicking. Yeah, he had a medical leave. And, uh, of course, we all understood medical leaves. Everybody's had to have them at some point, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but Glenn wasn't in the office when Marilyn was there, too. I, I think the primary difference is Marilyn came out of a classroom, so her job responsibilities as a classroom teacher ended, and she was full-time director, interim director during mm -hmm. that time. I, on the other hand, was, was still doing personnel, insurance, all those responsibilities, and then you become the director of schools and the bookkeeper. Because in March, you should be well on your way to having a budget for the next school year. Mm -hmm. And that process had not begun for us. And uh, we were told that we were to have one uh, together uh, by April, by the middle of April. I gave you what about three weeks three or four weeks to develop a budget <clears throat> of which I'd never really seen uh, I had pre-k at that time so I knew the pre-k budget so I knew the general format of a budget but the entire school budget I did really I didn't have a background in I guess my dad was right I should have stayed in accounting <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's not anything I did. Uh, Cindy Wyrick was uh, worked with the financial finance department during that time. Uh, Lenny Hope, you, Norma, the whole crew just kind of picked in, pitched together, and we all worked and put together a budget. Now, uh, I don't know how great a budget it was, but it was a balanced budget nonetheless. Mm -hmm. We weren't asking anybody for any extra funding. So, uh, and then on the heels of that, you're having to close the budget out. And that ends in June. And so both of those were a real test, <laughs> a challenge. But we did it. Have you found, like me, that as the years have gone on, when we first went to the central office, we were new, kind of insecure might be a good word for Very. it. Very. And over the years, the camaraderie has developed. Yeah. I think we have as good as or better camaraderie right now among our staff than we ever did. I think so, too. And so there are staff there that have worked together. Me, you, Sandra, we all work together at Luttrell. And that's a bond that I guess would, would not be broken. And as people have moved in to that office, I think there is that atmosphere is we're all in this together. And no one is independent from someone else. All of our jobs are interrelated. So uh, I think that that level of trust that each of us have with the other kind of lends itself to that camaraderie. Now, we disagree occasionally, but we can agreeably disagree, and that yeah, is a good thing. As long as everybody agrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Even if it's disagreeably agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I will say that everything's not always agreeable, mm -hmm. but I think... We all respect each other enough to respect each other's ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and there have been many a time that I didn't, I went into something and not agreed with it, but in the end changed my way of thinking just mm -hmm. because I trust the people I work with. And I think that's important. I have found that to be true with you. If I bring you something to sign, you pretty much just sign it. You don't scrutinize it or anything. No. And I try my best never to bring you anything that would cause you grief anyway. But and well, and and what? And it takes a lot of trust to do that. Yes, it does. And of course, in the early days, when we first, when I first went in that position, I felt like I was reading everything. Partly because I wanted to make sure nobody was making a mistake, and mm -hmm. the other is so that I could learn what went into federal programs or special ed because. Those are positions, although I've been to meetings and, you know, you understand the verbiage, you understand the concept, mm -hmm. but the depth of knowledge on that is not that great for me with uh, federal programs and special ed, although Sandra has done a really good job of training us all on special ed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the frightening thing to me would be about being in your position is that anything any of us do that are under your supervision, which is everybody in the school system, you are ultimately responsible for. Yeah, and and you have to take on that responsibility and you have to feel safe and secure in that I'm happy to defend you if I feel like you're, you're right in what you've done. 
and I'm just as happy to say you did that incorrectly and we need to backtrack and do it right. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that goes into the trust. Uh, I believe that we have a really good uh, group of people that we work with. Uh, I trust people and I think that's part of my personality is, is I'm very optimistic and I trust people off the bat until you give me a reason not to trust. And uh, I think that gets me through a lot of things. Uh, I do read most things that come through, especially early on. But it's like you said, if you bring me a document and you say, this is what this is, then I trust that you you have thoroughly vetted it and understand it. And there's no reason for me to reread all that that you have already read, especially in the fact that you have a, a deeper knowledge in what you do than I do. And we appreciate that trust. <laughs> but at the same time, I can think of several times that I have just almost panicked about something. I think it's the biggest deal in the world, which it is to me. I bring it to you, and you just kind of, you don't get overly upset about it. No. You don't react. You listen I, and think. Well, I think if both of us are jumping up and screaming, it's not going to serve anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'll jump up and scream. You stay relaxed. How's that? <laughs> but I, I've come to realize, and I guess it's with experience, I, I've come to realize there's not anything that if we work together that we can't work through. At, uh, I, I feel like the state or federal is not out to get us. They're out there to help us and work mm -hmm. with us. And if we have done something unknowingly wrong, then they will work with us to correct it. That we're all not going to... Uh, fall down at one time. I think it's just important to, to put it in perspective and know that at any level, nobody's out to try to get any of us. And if we make a mistake, then we own, it, we own that mistake and we correct it and move forward. I do think that um, the State Department is a great resource for us yes. and has been all of my central office experience. And I think that we have more credibility at the state level than we did maybe 30 years ago. I, I, I hope so. I, I hope think we do. Uh, the county's always been credible, but I hope as we grow that uh, we become known as uh, a school district that is reliable and is out to do the right thing. I think we're there, actually. Well, I... It makes me feel good when people from the state call and say, in an audit, this is one of the best audits we've ever had. Mm -hmm. Yours is the last of the year, and it is the best. We have no findings. When you're doing title and federal, that's what we got this year. And that's that feel-good moment. That's when I know that trust is there because I don't stand over you or Sandra. I trust that you all know what you're doing, and you're doing it correctly. And I know both of you all spend a lot of sleepless nights worrying about your own <laughs> departments. So I don't have to use, lose sleep over it. <laughs> We're glad to help you out. That way. <laughs> <laughs> Think nothing of it. <laughs> Central finance, when it came in, was a totally new animal to uh -huh. us. And I had always heard these horrid horror stories and still do. Yeah. from various counties that have it, how the, there's, it's so difficult. But ours has always operated smoothly from the yes. very outset. Yes. Well, you have to begin, I mean, realize what we were when we started with central finance. We didn't have anybody in finance at that time. Right. So we welcomed it. But it's like every job and every position it's the person you have in that position that will make or break that position. Uh, I find with the entire finance department, they weren't on a witch hunt. They weren't on this mission to show that the school system isn't doing what they should be doing or spending their money wisely. I uh, can guarantee you if Ms. Dyer was sitting here with us, she would say, you all had nothing starting out with and <laughs> no room to grow from it. So... Uh, I do think it's the person you have in the position, just like in our jobs. If if I was that person that was out to get you all and the people in central office and prove that you're wrong and I'm right, then it wouldn't be a successful office. And I think that's the same with central finance. Mm -hmm. uh, I, tr I trust them without a doubt. Uh, there was uh, 
a, a, a situation where I was out of town and one, first, one of the first things that Ms. Dyer said to me is, I put all this together, you can read through it, and I hope I've earned your trust through these years. I said, you have earned my trust. I would trust you with my own banking account. I am <laughs> fine with what you've done. And I always like to look over the numbers just because I know that anybody can make a mistake and I need to understand what's behind the numbers. But we have worked well with the finance department and uh, I, I'm, I'm happy that they're there. There have been several instances where that department has saved not just the school system, but has saved the county money just by consolidating things. In my time with Union County, particularly in the central office, we have come from the days when we barely had money to operate the entire school year to now we actually have a surplus yes. to carry over from one year to the next. Yes. And you've been able to... Um, complete several capital projects well, because I, of that. I think it's important that you keep your building and your facilities looking as good as they can. You have to realize that some of our buildings have a lot of age, 40, 50, 60 mm -hmm. years on them, and it's really tough to keep an old building looking good. From my standpoint, it's extremely difficult for students to take pride in a place that is running down around them. And uh, that's what I want our students to have is pride in their school, pride in their community and their county. And that's why I try my best to keep the buildings uh, looking as, as well as we possibly can. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, projects that we otherwise wouldn't be able to uh, if our finances weren't there. Uh, I know when you and I were in central office and we had several roofs that were leaking and we had buckets in the hallway and trash cans in the hallway. And in the attic. And we had to put, we had to go through county commission and get uh, borrow money to uh, fix those and pay it back. And uh, I always felt like that's a shame that we couldn't just fix that right there on the spot. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now we're in a position where we can do that and uh, give credit to finance and the school board and just trying to be careful with our with our money. And TNVA. It was a brand new experience for everybody, too. Uh, that came in under Mr. Goforth, but you mainly have, you've been the director most of the time since it's been in existence. We, uh, we started with the virtual school, Mr. Goforth, last year. Mm -hmm. So when he was removed in October, I think October or November of that year, whichever year that was, that was our virtual school's first year. So then Ms. Toppins had it until March, and then I've had it ever since. Actually, Mr. Goforth came back in uh, July of that following year and went out in, I think, January or February of uh, the next year. But yes, I've been the director primarily through the virtual school. Do you attribute them to part of the reason we have some more of the funding than we used to have before they existed? Somewhat. I mean... Somewhat, but not solely. No, not solely, because you have to remember, uh, in the early days, they we would we would have... we Our profit off of them, the, our 4% our, our share, was anywhere from two hundred fifty to $300,000. And so... Uh, Yes, in a sense, that does help. You don't ever say, well, that's not enough to do anything with. That's mm -hmm. plenty of money. But uh, the money that we have built up was done largely by looking at personnel and making sure that we're adhering to uh, class size but not over-employing people and, and just making sure, that, making sure that in personnel, any, in any business, and, it, and especially in any school system, your payroll is your major expense. Mm -hmm. So we have our revenue that comes in. So when you can cut from your payroll, uh, that's when you can see greater gains. So in the first two, three years, uh, we elimin eliminated several positions. Uh, remember, we used to have computer labs in all of our schools, and I've 
I did away with those positions. And I didn't just fire people. What we did is when someone mm -hmm. was retiring from those positions, then we just didn't rehire in those positions. And uh, there were some supervisory positions that once people retired from those, we just didn't refill. So that would be what I credit to, as well as finance, our finance department, uh, keeping a close eye on things. Mm -hmm. uh, down to the smallest thing is uh, they monitor our water bill and they let us know when there's a water leak somewhere and so that we can report that to maintenance. Little things like that can add up really quickly if you're not careful. And they do pay attention to every penny that goes out of that school system. And one good thing about central finance, they have all of the county departments. Yes. So they can sometimes buy in greater bulk than they used to could just us. Right. And I will also credit the finance department for bridging that gap between the school board and county commission. Uh, not in the not so recent past, <laughs> there wasn't a very good relationship between the school board and the county commission. And, uh, and I feel like that we have bridged that gap and I, I feel like that, that we work as a partnership now mm -hmm. rather than opposing forces. Having a common bookkeeper helps with that because what happens is if they have a question about the school system, uh, they can trust the, the answer that they're going to get mm -hmm. rather than be, um, uh, I guess, somewhat, I don't know. Dubious. Yes. <laughs> That's one of those five-cent words I pulled out the last. <laughs> and I appreciate that word. <laughs> so you were center office staff, then you were interim director, you were center office staff again for a short time, then, when Mr. Goforth left, were you interim again, or was that when you were appointed no, director? No, I was interim from the time he left until uh, June, and that's when they interviewed for the director position, and so I applied for it. And that was in 2013, I think you were officially voted in, if I remember correctly. That could possibly be true. <laughs> the reason I remember that, my wife had a stroke the day of the night of the board meeting where they voted oh my you goodness. in, so I heard about it on the phone, you know, officially. Oh, well, I hope that wasn't a total bad day for you. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> that brightened it up somewhat. Um, and your current contract has been renewed. Yes. Third time, I think. It was original, yes. then it's been renewed twice. Yes, I started with a four-year contract, and then it was renewed with three years. And so I'm now into my third contract, four years. So this is the first of my extension of my four-year contract, first year. So on June 30, because I'm board clerk, I know some of this stuff. Yeah. Yes. On June the 30, 2024. Yeah is when your current contract expires. That is true. At this point, what do you think the future holds? Do you anticipate a possible renewal? Well, Ronnie, you and I are not getting any younger. Uh, true. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, don't, I guess you make those decisions. I don't want to make that decision now because I may change my mind three times between now and then. Mm -hmm. uh, Everybody makes those decisions around, you know, do I feel like that I can still contribute? I always felt like that's the most important thing that I could do when I walked out the door is say that it is better than when I came in the door. Mm -hmm. And I want to do that. There are certain things I want to see through. And um, I think, unfortunately, sometimes that there's always another something out there. You don't ever say, and then when this is done, I'm done. Mm -hmm. You just... you. Keep one thing just adds on to another, uh, but I turned 62 uh, in March of that 2004 year. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I'll just make that decision as I get closer. Uh, I don't want, I would never say in April or May of that year, yeah, I've decided I'm going to retire. Uh, I want to give plenty of notice because I want what's best for the school system. And the school system being able to prepare for that, 
you and I know, both know that having some stability in the school system means a whole lot. So when we were in that time of Wayne, Marilyn, me, Wayne, me, all that, <laughs> even though things were running smoothly, that, that, it was that, frustrating. It is frustrating. And it's frustrating all the way down to the teacher level because they don't know what to expect because each of us have different visions and viewpoints on what we expect. And it's, I think it's important that they know what to expect. I mean, you want to know to, every day when you come to the office what to expect from me. Mm -hmm. And when that, a new person comes into that position, you're on edge until you can kind of fill it out and see exactly what that's going to be like. I think anybody is. So uh, I want I want to give plenty of notice so that the board can make considerations and we can have a very smooth transition into a new director because at some point there's going to be that transition. Mm -hmm. And I just want that to be smooth. And I'll be honest with you, I had considered appointing an assistant director. But the problem with that to me is if you spend all this time prepping and planning and putting all that together, you may not even have the same school board at that time. That's true. And so you put a lot of uh, things in place so that we could be prepared, and then all of a sudden you have a different board and they may not have the same vision, and I don't want to set somebody up for that. We have had a kind of highly unusual rate of stability on the school board for several years. Yes, and... And, and I, that helps, I think. It, that helps, and the idea that it's a very workable, working school board. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't say enough about how thankful I am that they allow me to do my job. They're a comfortable group of people. They I are. feel like that I can go to them and say, I goofed up here, which yeah. I do almost every month. The board <laughs> may even forget something or whatever. And I don't feel uncomfortable admitting that to them. No, and it's not a school board that will... will just rubber stamp everything you want to do. Right. It's a school board that will question you on things, and you want that. You don't want a rubber stamp because you want people, if I present something to them that they're not in favor of, I need to know that, and I need to see how we can meet in the middle with things. So that's what I'm grateful for, that that they will question you, and they, they want to understand and know what direction they're going and what direction we are going as a school system, but at the same time, they're not in my office saying, this is what I want, and I want you, I expect you to do it. Mm -hmm. I've yet to have that experience. If somebody coming into my office tell me that they have an expectation, and they expect me to carry it out, mm -hmm. and for that I'm grateful, because I know it's not always been that way. No, times have changed yes, they have. tremendously. <laughs> um, assuming that... 2024 comes and you look around and you decide, I think I'd like to retire and enjoy a few years of retirement yeah. with the family and whatever. Before your contract expires in 2024, what would you like to see the school system accomplish that hasn't exactly been completely accomplished yet? Well, I, th I, I think we could do more. Once we wrote out the one-to-one, -one, um, I think the I think the community appreciated. I think it went really well. I'd like to see that go beyond just you know the having that computer and students doing work. I would like to see us at a place where our curriculum is laid out and uh, we change the way we approach teaching. Uh, I, I would like to be in this position when we turn that corner. Uh, a lot of teachers have embraced it. <clears throat> some teachers don't necessarily trust it, and some teachers just say, no, that's not the way I teach. I would like to turn that corner and see us uh, have a platform in place where teaching uh, is easier for teachers and uh, better for students. So that would be... That would be the one thing that I would like to see before I leave is that we have provided the professional development and our teachers are comfortable teaching that way. 
this is my 33rd year so I look back to where we started 33 years ago and it's like a totally different place educationally speaking it is but Ronnie I thought about this wouldn't you like to be in a classroom and understand the technology mm -hmm. but have the technology uh, now that we would have loved to had then what we could have accomplished if I we agree. had yes absolutely <laughs> uh, we just got through paying for the high school didn't we yes we did last payments made it's ours like yes. stock and barrel <laughs> so that now saves what do we us. do with it <laughs> exactly that saves us in the school system five hundred thousand dollars a year yes but there's been talk about possibly a new middle school in the future yes grateful that the county commission recognizes just as we do that we need a new middle school uh, that building was built in the mid 50s mm -hmm. it's for several different reasons it is outlasted what a normal or typical building would that's used as a school but not just that we're overcrowded we have the numbers mm -hmm. at that middle school that we had at the high school when the high school was there so we have classrooms down, and, and you, you will not remember, <laughs> but that downstairs was the cafeteria at one time. because yeah, before my time. Well, that, we moved into the new part of that building my freshman year. Mm -hmm. So half of my year was spent in the cafeteria downstairs, and the other half was in the new cafeteria. And so we have classes. We have one, two, six classes down in that area. And that's not the most ideal place to have classes. Uh, the class sizes or, or the, the square footage is smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it's, it's a basement, so sometimes it get down. we have to work to keep those classrooms comfortable for our students. Uh, we have classes upstairs in what used to be the old ag building. Mm -hmm. And we have art up there. We have band in that vocational wing. It's, they weren't built for that. Right. We had to turn them into that. So um, for many reasons, we, we really need a new middle school. And that would be another corner I want to turn. I want to see that, I want to see that before, uh, before I retire because I, I'm very passionate about the middle school age kids, that whole concept. And I would like to see that, uh, that one thing done before I leave. So, and there's so many things that have been put in place. There was a time I would never have dreamed there would be a PE teacher for every single school, even the smallest elementaries. So yeah. Next year there will be a school nurse in every single school, no yeah. matter the size. And I, I, I'm like that. And there's a lot of more. There's several different things more that we need to do mm -hmm. in that regard. I would love to see art in the elementaries. I'd love to see uh, a full-time guidance counselor in every elementary. So there's more that we need to do. Um, I can't, you can't do it all at one time. Right. And uh, my vision would be uh, that after we got music established and PE established and school nurses are essential, SROs in every building, I really would like to see art in every elementary. I, I think that is important to kids that age. And there is a time we would have laughed at the very idea, but the fact that all these other things have been accomplished. It's, it's very doable. Yes. It's very doable. When you and I taught, we had a PE teacher that went to three or four different elementaries. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an art teacher, we had a music teacher that wheeled a piano up and down the hall. <laughs> Dawn Patelke was wonderful at everything she did, and she's very <laughs> passionate about what she did, but that could not have been good for a piano. <laughs> Especially when you rolled it against certain faculty members' legs. <laughs> yes, that's right. But she, she wanted to expose those students, and I think that was very, I think that was very admirable of her. But then you probably would have not imagined the Lectoral of having a full-time music teacher and a fiddle club at Lectoral. Exactly. So I, we can't stay stagnant, mm -hmm. and I want our kids to be able to experience so many different things to get to understand or desire what they want to do 
and their future. I don't want them to be limited by anything. So I would like to see music in all, all of our, our art in all of our buildings. And I, we did, with the help of federal funds and general fund, uh, make sure that all of our uh, music teachers had, uh, could supply after our uh, activities so that they could do a choir at the elementary if they wanted to or whatever they chose to do. But we funded all of our music teachers to be able to do that. And it's outstanding. It is. It's it outstanding. is. We haven't talked much about sports. And I know that sports is a passion of yours. Yeah. And you have been... Tell us a little bit about your track record in sports in well, the school system. I don't talk about my track record, but I will say that I enjoyed coaching. And coaching, I, I grew up in a competitive atmosphere. And you are still competitive. <laughs> I am. And coaching uh, just kind of fulfills that need for me to have competition at whatever I do. And so when I, I, when I came to Electoral, I started teaching at Electoral, Mr. Arnwine asked if I would be interested in coaching basketball, which I'd never done. I love playing the sport. And that was a, a learning curve for me because, I mean, I would not had that experience. I knew what I did on the court, but I didn't, I didn't have any experience coaching. And you just learn in it and, and grow in it. And, uh, and we were fairly successful at Electoral. But we're one of the larger elementaries at that time. Is either us or Maynardville, you know, the two larger schools competing against the two smaller schools. Well, I will say that I was, I've been beat out by Sharps Chapel and Big Ridge, and it was a bitter pill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then when I moved to the high school, I helped coach. I was an assistant coach for the girls' basketball team, which I enjoyed. And uh, I coached at Sharps Chapel when I was the principal there. And these are things that you wouldn't typically do, but I just enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I thoroughly enjoyed that relationship with the kids. And when you get out of the classroom, when you get into those administrative positions, you're just one step removed from your students. And that was a way that you could really stay in touch and in tune with your students. So I coached at Sharps Chapel, which I will say was probably the most fun year I ever spent coaching <laughs> because uh, we weren't expected to win a whole lot. I had to go down to the sixth grade to get enough players to even make a team uh, for our varsity because you had an A team and a B team. And uh, we worked really hard. I remember in that first month when I was coaching them and getting to know them, they said uh, a year or two ago uh, that the school took the ball team down for this uh, state invitational tournament. It wasn't nobody invited us. You just invited yourself and win if you wanted to. And so I told them, I said, um, we will not be going to that tournament unless you win first place in the county. Because if you can't beat what's here, then why do we go to Nashville to play? Mm -hmm. So that was the goal I set for them. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't expect we would attain it. So I, I can <laughs> say that we'll go to the National if you all want to. So uh, those boys were probably the hardest working ball team that I ever had. I mean, they were a team that would have ran through the brick wall. And sometimes they hit it and tried, but they didn't get through. <laughs> Uh, our first game that we played that season was uh, this invitational that they had at the high school at that time. And um, so our first game was against Maynardville. So we're the smallest school in the county. I think at that time we may have had 20 or less eighth graders. Uh, and our competition had probably four times that many eighth graders alone. And we, they only played two quarters, and we lost two to 22. <laughs> I thought, this is going to be a really long season, but I like the kids, so we'll see where it goes. <laughs> and so, uh, and they did work hard, and it was a challenge, and I had help there helping me coach on days that I wasn't there. I had to be in Van at Vanderbilt Hospital, uh, but uh, they worked hard, and our very last game of the season was against Mainville for the championship. <laughs> And uh, I guess coaching-wise, 
when you get to the tournament, most all the coaching is done. You've coached all you can coach. You've done, you can't throw in something new at a tournament. You've had all season. You can't come up with this brilliant play, especially with elementary age kids, because they're going to be just, <laughs> it's going to be horrible. But um, I, I just try to motivate. I remember at one time out, we got down by six or eight points, and I just said, I want you to look behind you. Everyone from Sharp Chapel is here supporting you. And you can beat this team. And we went on and we won by maybe two points, two or three points. And I'll never forget Upal Hall. Upal Hall was one of my players. And uh, his mom and dad originally did not want him to play. But I saw him in PE and he was just a natural athlete. And I asked his parents, you know, why? What could, what could I do to convince you to allow him to play? I said, well, you know, tobacco comes in season about that time, and, and we raise tobacco, and, and, and you have to do it when it's in case. I said, I understand that. I raised, my dad raised tobacco, and I understand those things. So I will excuse them from, from practice, or I won't practice on days that you have to work in tobacco, because if you're working in it, probably some of these other boys are too. So I'll work around the tobacco season. <laughs> and he allowed him to play. And so in that game, we're playing, and we are down by one point, I think. And I had to put them in a man-to-man -man because times were, you're less than a minute. And we didn't have, we didn't run man-to-man -man ever. But I had to describe for them on the sideline, this is what this is going to look like. You just stay with your man. Wherever they go, you stay with them and try to create a turnover. And Upal was still playing zone. He was the only one that was playing a zone. <laughs> so he's standing right here, and his man is wide open under the goal, unbeknownst to Upal. But in that moment, it didn't matter because their guard made a pass over to the wing because they had set a screen and the wing was wide open and their Upal was standing just two feet away from him and he stole the ball and ran it down the court and hit a layup to put us up by one point and I was so proud of that boy and they put they carried him on their shoulders across that court mm. and I just think that's why we do this yeah it's all about the kids yes it? well last words from you good doctor well I don't know that I have any last words I I remain grateful that, as I'm sure you do too, that uh, I was given the opportunity to work in the county that I grew up in because that's where my passion is. Um, my mom and dad worked in the county clerk's office from 1970 until 1994, and I always felt like that uh, they exemplified what servants were to their community. And I feel like that's what we are in the school system, is we're here to serve our community and to, to make uh, education the best it can be for our community. And so I think as long as you kind of keep that idea that you're here to serve, uh, this is not some kind of right that you have or anything like that, that you're always here serving your community. I think if that's in, in the back of your head at all times, I don't think you would ever fail. And that's what we try to do in the series of interviews is to highlight people that don't look at it as an entitlement. Yeah. But they look at it as an opportunity to serve and to make the county better. And we have a lot of people like that in our county. And I do think you're one of the people that we are better off for you having served where and when and how you have served. You're not going to get more money because you said that, but I appreciate it. <laughs> Can I take that back? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. But we do so appreciate you coming. We appreciate you all tuning in. I'm Ronnie Mitzi, and thank you for joining us for this interview to highlight one of our Union County citizens that makes this county a better place to live and work. Thank you. Thank you.